Hey, good evening, everyone. I'm Richard Byrne, and you are here for Copyright for Teachers with me and Beth Holland. And uh, hi, Beth. Hi, Richard. How's it going? It's going great. How are you? Thanks for having sure. me. Hey, my pleasure. Uh, for folks who don't know Beth, uh, who are you? What do you do? <laughs> who am I? What do I do? Uh, so my name's Beth Holland. I'm coming to you from Newport, Rhode Island, and it's almost as cold here as it is in Maine right now. Uh, but I am a doctoral candidate at Johns Hopkins in the Entrepreneurial Leadership and Education Program, and then I've been working in and around schools, I realize, since 1998, which is kind of crazy. So I've taught a lot of different subjects and done a lot of different things from teaching to director of technology in uh, to professional development. And then I write a lot. So and sailing. Me. And sailing. I do go sailing. We still have to go hiking or skiing or something one of yep. these days. Yep. So, yeah. And uh, so this is a good time to segue into some housekeeping items for folks who have never been on a webinar with me before. There's a few things you should know. Uh, number one, uh, this is being recorded. So if there's something that we cover that goes by too quickly and you want us to go back and do it again, uh, feel free to say that. Uh, if you're watching the recording and you have questions for me later, feel free to send me an email, richard at burn.media, and I'll get back to you as quickly as possible, or you can send a, uh, an email to Beth as well at uh, brholland at gmail.com. That works. Uh, I'll, include, I'll include all that in, uh, when I send out the email with these slides. So the slides that we shared tonight, uh, you can all take a look at them. And, uh, oh, Last housekeeping thing that I always forget until it pops up. I have two rather large dogs. Beth has a couple of dogs. Uh, and from time to time, my dogs make an appearance in the background on a webinar. So if you hear some barking and then you hear me go silent, I'm probably trying to quiet the dogs down. Uh, I might and, have that at about 7.30 when my husband comes home. Yeah, well, at about 7.30, it may happen here too. Perfect. Also, we may have... A, uh, oh, baby a monitor. monitor. Baby monitor in, in my house as well. All right. Uh, all right. So on that note, uh, because it is being recorded, keeping the webcam on makes for a massive recording. So I'm going to turn off my webcam, and I think Beth's going to turn off her webcam, and I'm going to share my screen so you can see all the slides. So here we go. All right. So let's uh, let's get started on this topic. This is a topic that I'm quite passionate about, I think, and I know Beth is quite passionate about it. We, we talked for two hours about it yesterday and even more before that. Uh, mm -hmm. so let's talk about copyright for teachers and why students, or why teachers should care about it and maybe why your students should care about it too and you know, what is what is copyright to begin with. Uh, you know, Beth, what do you think is a good quick definition of uh, copyright that teachers could understand? I mean, I think what's important to know is, you know, I think we could actually just take the words right there, and it has to do with whether or not you have the rights to copy somebody else's work. So if we just flipped it and looked at the word itself, and so, you know, if we look at it from a, a business perspective, copyright protects the intellectual property and the creative um, the creative genius of people that have invented things and not to be taking it from someone else. And I, mean, I think why teachers should care, I know what really drove it home to me years ago when I was still in the classroom uh, was a comment from a Harvard Law professor Lawrence Lessig who made the comment that we're raising a generation of pirates and that in this age of technology with Google images and everything else, kids just have this sense that they can take whatever they find online and they're not actually thinking about you know, whose talents and whose efforts and whose creativity and whose work went into producing whatever it is they're now suddenly taking. And whether that's taking images or, or copy and pasting content or downloading videos, whatever it is, it's just not really thinking, I think almost from an empathy perspective, where did this come from and how can I be respectful of the person who generated it? So copyright by law protects the creator you know, of that intellectual property and what it is that they've, you know, actually published and produced. And then, you know, as teachers, I think it almost comes down to, you know, I would start with ethics of how do we really teach our students how to respect those rights and, and respect the people that created things. Yeah, and that, you know, I think that's a, 
a good way of thinking about it, and I often would would equate it in many ways to to plagiarism, uh, or, or bring up the issue of plagiarism with with my own students when we uh, would look at you know, okay, the classic example for me uh, was when I started using Animoto with one particular group of freshman students. Uh, so way back in 2010, it can, or 2000, no, it was even earlier than that. I want to say it may have been 2008. Uh, whenever, whenever Animoto came out, when it first came out, and I was super excited about it, and my kids were really excited about it, and one of my students discovered that you could upload your own music to it. And so I had some students who were making, they were making videos about the presidents of the United States. It was a pretty simple project. And I had some students who uploaded some music that they had on uh, on their own computers uh, that was like, you know, whatever top 40 album was out at the time. Uh, I think it was something from Jay-Z. Uh, <laughs> I can't, I can't you know, quite put my finger on, on what the title of the song was, but uh, my students thought it was great, and they uploaded it, and they thought that would be the perfect background music for a video about George Washington, and it turns out it wasn't for for many many reasons. Uh, but I had to explain to them why can't we use this? And so that's much like if you had uh, written a paper and then someone else copied it and turned it in and said it was their own. Uh, it's a very very similar concept, and I think that's part of the reason why why kids should care, and that's why um, we need to teach this to our students. You know, and to the end of being that, that digital pirate, you know, uh, that, that person who's, you know, if you think back, uh, some of us of a certain generation, a certain age, will remember Napster. Uh, who, who in here remember, had a Napster account and uh, downloaded some things through Napster? Remember that? Yes. <laughs> We're the same I, age. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, well, I knew you knew. Uh, but I remember when when I got when I got my e machines computer. So here I am, I'm dating myself now. I got my e machines computer, and my roommate in college uh, taught me how to download stuff from Napster. And then you remember Metallica sued Napster, and everybody was up in arms about about this. Um, and, and I think that's you know. For a lot of us, that may be where we were introduced to copyright. Um, you know, and mm -hmm. that moving, as you move forward, you know, now we now we look at okay, you're on Google Images, you right click and save, or you're on YouTube and you find a video you like, and uh, you may or may not know about a program that will help you download it. Sorry, Beth, I cut you off. No, it's okay. Um, I you were, I was just thinking about on your music one, and I know. Your example, and we were talking about this also dating ourselves yesterday, but the idea that at one point um, Prince or the artist that was formerly known as Prince or whatever he was going by at the time was actually suing all these people on YouTube because people were making their own home music videos using his music. And just, I think one of the things that I had a hard time explaining to a lot of my students and then also to a lot of teachers when I was doing professional development work is. Like just because you purchase the license on iTunes doesn't mean that that gives you the license broadly to use this music whatever you want. Um, and so it, you know, essentially all those terms of service that we don't ever read, it's, you know, basically it says like you bought it for your personal use. And so, you know, my students were making a music video and it turned into quite the lesson in persuasive writing and understanding legal where I actually had a friend of mine who's an intellectual property attorney Skype into the class and explain to the students like what does it mean if you remix work where is it copyright violation where is it not so that they could actually learn here's what it means and here's how you know we can still be super creative but also respect you know the law that's in place to protect other people's work um, so, you know, that was such a great lesson and the irony of it was after they did everything correctly, we still got a cease and desist from YouTube. And so then they got to learn how to write a letter back with a legal response explaining that they had done everything correct. And eventually they, the YouTube allowed their video to stay up, but they got a much bigger lesson than I think any of us were, were bargaining for. And I think there's a lot more to it than 
you know, it started with understanding copyright, and I think it, it created the avenue to learn so much more. Yeah, and the yeah. other example that the other example we 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 talked about yesterday was, uh, or that I gave yesterday, particularly if you're trying to teach copyright to kids who are really into sports, who really really enjoy sports. Uh, at the beginning of any NFL game or National Hockey League game or, or pick your professional sports league, uh, you'll hear the disclaimer, and it's very quick. It takes about 10 seconds for for the broadcast to, to put out this disclaimer, but it specifies that this broadcast is for the, the private use of our home viewing audience, which is why if you go to a sports bar to watch a sporting event, but technically, they are supposed to have a different uh, package, di different um, cable package or satellite package than what you and I might get if we just called up DirecTV or Time Warner Cable or you know pick your pick your television provider, uh, because that's a that's a different type of use. That's not a, a private individual use. That's a that's a, a public display use. So anyway, speaking of that, speaking of public displays of things. Mm -hmm. Let's stop right-clicking on Google Images. <laughs> right. Uh, um, for a lot of reasons. Uh, how many reasons can we come up with? We can count. Many. Uh, many. So let, let's, we'll start with the practical. I'll start with the very practical reason that I've used with kids for years. And that is when you right-click on the first image you find on Google Images or a random website that you come across in your travels and you right click and you save that image you don't always know what it is you're actually downloading yes you might be ripping that picture down but you might be taking a bunch of other stuff with it that you're not aware of uh, that could harm your computer harm your network harm your phone uh, I think the uh, the the spot the uh, Security software for, for laptops is, is far more advanced than security uh, software for, for phones at this point in terms of mobile browsers and, and, and protection from downloading spyware and whatnot. Uh, and so that's, that's a, just a practical point to bring up to, to kids who own their own, own devices. That's one thing. Um, but you might, might also consider that, you know, the next time you're looking for, well, Beth has a great example of this. Uh, I won't give it away. But I'll say that the, the next time you're you're searching for an image, uh, put in your name or put in uh, you know your put in a, a put in a, a dog or put in something generic, and you may find lots of things that aren't what at all what you thought they would be at all. And you've probably seen this yourself if you've been on Google Images much. That you put in your name, you know. For example, uh, I put my name. If you put my name in, you'll find me. But you'll also find a guy who's good at karate. Uh, you'll find a doctor. You'll find uh, a guy who's a voice coach. You'll find a children's author. A uh, whole lot of things that aren't me. Uh, they are Richard Byrne, but they're not me. Uh, so it's not always our best place to find images. Uh, that, that's, a, that's one reason. Uh, Beth has an interesting story about a horny yeah. toad. <laughs> right. Wait. Go back for a second, because I, I have two more on still this like Google piece, and I think one of them is you know when we think about copyright, um, one of the challenges is framing it inside sort of a broader media literacy. And you know I was working with some fifth grade teachers, and it was like really early, like very beginning research project, and so the kids were just learning what they were supposed to do, and. She was, you know, the teacher came to me, she's so frustrated, and she's like, every single time I ask the kids, where did you find this information, all they tell me is, oh, I found it on Google. And so I think part of it from a bigger perspective is that how do we teach them that, you know, just like you're demonstrating right now, you know, Google is a search engine, and how do search engines work? And then the results that it pulls up, some of the things you might be able to use, some of the things you might not be able to use. Um, and so it's, it really creates just this opportunity that's really distracting, by the way. Uh, that, that's not me. I know, that's not you. Um, <laughs> but it, it creates an opportunity to talk at a broader level. And then it also helps, you know, you mentioned plagiarism, but when you start teaching research skills about the idea of citations. 
So how do we give credit? How do you keep track of where stuff came from? And you know, I think when you have this like, oh yeah, I used I did a Google image search, I found it on Google, you know, that's that's not an actual source. Um, you know, be, it, I guess a, a tangible example might have been, you know, like if you'd actually gone shopping and someone said, well, where'd you get it? And you said, well, I got it at the mall. Well, there's like 300 stores at the mall. Where in the mall did you go? Um, I realized nobody goes to a mall anymore and they're all shut, shutting down. I was, all I could think of was like, oh, I just get it on Amazon. Um, but the, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that same idea, though, is just, you know, how do we help our kids understand, like, what they're taking, where it came from, and then starting to build you know, that really good practice of then citing and giving credit. Um, hey, I remember when you first posted that picture of you eating whatever that was. Just oh, yeah. That was like a five-pound like chocolate ago. cake uh, out in Salt Lake City. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I don't know what, the, you know, and I, I know I've looked at this before, but I forgot, I forgot that I was interviewed for this, uh, this blog. Uh, mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, but while we're while we're here, why did I pop up on on this, and why do these guys pop up, or you know, why do other people pop up? Now, a lot of it has to do with the the meta tags that, that are attached to the image, because Google's not really looking for the image; they're looking for uh, the data that's that's behind the image. Uh, kind of, and there's a question there. Uh, there's a question there from Francis, and I'm trying to hold on. Let me pop it out. I'm trying to trying to see the whole thing there. Um, Beth, can you see that question? Yeah, I can. I can read it. You ready? Okay. Okay. Go for it. Um, I'm interested to know about how we can protect material that we've created ourselves. Example, using Microsoft Office tools, so that others can't use or adapt it themselves for their own financial gain. I normally don't mind sharing regular ELT materials, but I spend many, many hours creating a specific course for motorcycle mechanics. Just wondering if you have advice. Perhaps this isn't relevant for this webinar. I think it's totally relevant for this webinar. Yeah. Um, Francis, I, there's a couple of options. I mean, as an individual, if you are posting something, you always have the right to license it as all rights reserved. Um, I actually have that on my blog, like so for content that I've generated, as much as I would love for you to share the link to anything that I've written, I don't want you to just like take the whole thing. Um, and we're going to dig into it as well, or Richard, if you, I don't know if you want to skip around. Um, there's something called a Creative Commons license, and what that allows you to do is to create an individual license that you can add to you know, this set of materials that you've put together or an image that you've created or you can license like your entire website or blog or anything else, which that license then allows you to control how people actually can use it. Um, now, if someone doesn't respect your answer, like if you've said, no, this is Creative Commons licensed, don't use it, um, and someone does it anyways, I mean, it's not going to like block them, but now you have the ability to come back and say, hey, that's not right, you know, I licensed it for this use. Um, and one of those licenses is to say, like, you cannot use this for financial gain. It's a, a non-commercial use license. So um, the Creative Commons website is a great source for getting started on that. I know we have a slide for that somewhere. Um, yeah, we do have a slide for that somewhere. <laughs> it's yeah. toward the end. It's sort of towards yeah. the end. Um, so we'll, we'll circle back around to that, but I think you know, that's certainly one thing you can do. Another piece is, and Richard and I were talking about this yesterday, um, you can lock different kinds of documents. So, for example, like with Google Documents, you can, in the settings, say, like, you can't copy it, you can't download it, you know, you get what you get. So that's one way, you know, again, if someone really wants to rip you off, they will, but it's going to make it harder and they'll have to think about it. Um, I've locked PDFs before. I actually just used SlideShare the other day, and when I uploaded it, you're not allowed to clip from it. You can't download the whole thing because um, you're absolutely right. Like if you've really worked and you're happy to share and you want people to benefit from the information that you would like to then contribute, but you don't want them to take it. Um, there's, you know, pay attention to settings. I think that's another way uh, that it helps. Yeah, and and depending on the type of content, I mean, you Beth just mentioned uh, you know, document-based materials, but 
you can also do this with, with videos. Uh, you know, there, there are many things you can do with videos. By default, when you upload something to, to YouTube, if you're talking about uh, content you, you've opened for, for YouTube, um, or uploaded to YouTube by default, that's all copyrighted. Uh, and the YouTube Terms of Service uh, forbid downloading content that's copyrighted from YouTube. Uh, that's why I no longer will talk about uh, how to download content from YouTube. There are tools that do it. You're, you can go and find them on your own if you would like, but I, I don't teach that, and my stance when people ask me about it is you're not supposed to do it. Uh, I, I use a service now for uh, my online courses. So there, there are some courses that, that I teach online that are not free, uh, and I use a service called Gumroad that applies digital rights management to it uh, so that so that someone can't just down, uh, sign up for the class one time and then share all the content from the course with you know, all of their closest 200 friends. Um, and I, I didn't always do that uh, for a long time. I, I left it kind of on the honor system, and uh, recently I, I kind of got burned on that a, a few times from people not respecting, not respecting the copyright. Um, yeah. So, Francis, I... I Shameless plug for Gumroad. I have no, I have no financial interest in them at all. Uh, it's just a, a really great service for that kind of online course. Just to, as a follow up to your, to your question there. Uh, and Tracy asks, are those the, uh, are the, are those the walls in my barn? Yes, that, that's one of my, that's one of my, uh, barn barn walls. Uh, all right. So we kind of kind of got off on that tangent a little bit, but that's. That's great. Uh, I'm That's happy to go. Great, yeah. yeah, it's a great tangent. Uh, yeah, and I think too, just to kind of wrap up our tangent, and I, I thank Francis for for sharing the the questions. Is I think when we come back to like why is this so important, and I think one of the things that's really important also is like how are we teaching our colleagues, our administrators, and parents about this as well? Because you know that there's parents at home that probably don't know this either, and you know the kid has a project or they're looking for something, and they probably get the like, oh yeah, just go get it on Google. So I think again, big picture, like teaching literacy, this is an important conversation to have across the board. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I haven't think about. I'm not going to ask anyone to out their uh, <laughs> their administrator, but if you think about how many times have you seen a a presentation from someone who's above you on the on the chain of command who has, you know, a watermarked image within their slides uh, or, or within a document. Uh, you know, it, it's a it's an issue that needs to be needs to be shared uh, across the board. Now, we can talk more about about the digital rights management piece and what to do if someone does uh, steal your work. Um, and actually, I have a long article on, on how to handle that. Uh, but the short version is uh, you can file a Digital Millennium Copyright Act uh, if it's a, a violation that's happened online. Digital Millennium Copyright Act notice. Um, it's, it's something online. Uh, there was another, I thought there was another question in there, but I can't uh, see. Oh. No, nope. Tracy congratulates you for having walls. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, well, they're not finished yet, <laughs> but, but I'm working on them. Thanks. All right, uh, so so Tracy's been following the saga of my walls. Uh, it's, it's been an ongoing project. I thought it would be a quick project back in July. It's almost November. Uh, so anyway, uh, so Beth <laughs> has a really cool story about the search for a horny toad with eighth graders that I think... Uh, illustrates why Google Images may not be the best place to uh, to do a search for an image. Yeah, and, and, I th and I'm, I'm going to tie it in with, um, you know, with our copyright conversation as well. So if, you know, ladies who are out there, you might remember there's a, I don't know if the clothing brand is still around, but there was a clothing brand called Horny Toad, named after the official Texas horned toad lizard, which you see in front of you. And I had a pair of horny toad pants on, and it has it actually has a little like embroidered toad, um, kind of like where your belt loops are. So you know, like lots of things have logos on them. I happen to have that. So I have this group of you know 13 year olds who say, "Oh, Miss Holland, what is that thing on your pants?" And I said, "Oh, it's a horny toad." Well, you can all imagine how well that went over with a group of 13 year olds. 
And so then I get, you know, the one sneaky little bugger that says, oh, what does a real one look like? So now I've got, you know, the projectors fired up. I'm standing in a group of 20 plus, you know, eighth graders, and I'm trying to figure out, well, how do I find a horny toad? And I also did not know at the time it was called the Texas Horned Toad Lizard. And the last thing I wanted to do was a Google search for, quote, horny toad. So, I mean, I'm trying to remember, like, where I bought the pants from. Like, could I go to that shopping website to find the pants, to find the something? And, of course, no. All I get is the embroidered version. Um, I used a website called Archive, which is a search engine of animals, which finally helped me figure out I was looking for... I had to search by geography, knowing that it lives somewhere in the American Southwest, um, to like, uh, yeah, it's A-R-K, yeah, to figure out, like, it's called a Texas horned toad lizard. I mean, 45 minutes later, maybe not 45, 25 minutes later, I had found my Texas horned toad lizard, and we'd had a really big conversation about, well, how can we make sure that what we're finding is actually accurate? Um, and I kept explaining, like, well, if I had typed it into Google and I let their little 13-year-old minds go crazy, like, who knows what we would have come up with, but it would probably have not been the Texas horned toad lizard. Um, I know I saw Richard put the picture up, and he found it on Wikipedia. You found it on Wikipedia, right, Richard? No, um, I, oh. no I, I didn't. I, I, I muted myself because I was clicking. Oh. Uh, no, I so... I went to Wikipedia. Here's how I got there. I went to Wikipedia to search for a horny toad. And horny to that search led me to horned Texas horned lizard. Mm -hmm. And the image that I found on Wikipedia was a Creative Commons licensed picture, Creative Commons license 3.0. And I could have used it uh, and given attribution and whatnot. But I was kind of in a hurry. And I, wanted to, and I wanted to find a public domain image. So uh, once I found, found the proper name for it, I went to Pixabay, uh, which I'll put on the screen here, P-I-X-A-B-A-Y, Pixabay. And on Pixabay, I put in a search for horned lizard, I believe is how I got there. And then I went down here. And I found the little buddy that we see on the screen right now. And we can see it's a free for commercial use, no attribution required. And I went in and downloaded it in one of those sizes, probably 1920 by 1340. Um, and that's how, I, that's how I got to it. Uh, now, why did I use a public domain picture? Largely because... Um, I was in a hurry, and I didn't want to copy and paste all the attribution information over to the other slide. And this picture is actually a little bit higher resolution than the one that I found on Wikipedia. But all that to say that Wikipedia can be a great place to find Creative Commons licensed and public domain images for all kinds of topics and projects and things. They're not always the best resolution, which is why I will often start there and then See if I can find something a little bit better on Pixabay or Unsplash or uh, another site like that. So yeah. that's how we, that's how we got there. Right. Okay. And you know, again, the, actually, the work on Archive it is all watermarked, and it's not something that I can't remember exactly what the license is. But anything that you pull up is watermarked from Archive, um, and we used a lot of those images. But and this is I know we're going to segue at some point into. Um, you know, kind of talking more about this idea of like fair use versus not fair use. Um, but we would t we used a lot of these kinds of images when we had something that was not going to be published to the web. And so, you know, it's you, know, you can see right there that one's copyright Ruchira Soma somebody or others. Um, you know, and then there are those terms of use. So we would use it, you know, only if it was something that was. You know, it says right there, in educational materials, you know, in hard copy within the establishment. So we would use it for things that, you know, were printed out in school. It wasn't something that we would then, you know, share on YouTube or share on a blog or anything else. And, you know, again, really trying to take a lot of time with the kids to help them understand 
you know, what does this mean and how do we really be respectful for the people that are creating this? Because I mean, like a website like this has phenomenal photography and it's not something any of us could have ever, you know, created ourselves. And so to be able to give, to teach how to give proper attribution and to respect the art um, of the people that created the information. And I thought that was something that was important. Um, I noticed in the, the questions, uh, Tracy made a comment that, you know, has a, she has a colleague that has some copyrighted things, you know, posted on their website. And, you know, at some point that's a conversation for other people to have. But I think, again, if we're, if we're trying to model best practices for our kids, what do we want them to know in the big picture? And how do we want them to view um, you know, the respect for materials and, and how do they want to feel? Um, wait, can I tell the story about the awesome librarian? I don't yes, think you had that anywhere else. Yes, this is an awesome librarian story and then we'll, uh, then we'll address the, the fair use questions and yeah. get into that quagmire. Perfect. So I, I desperately wished I could remember this woman's name. I was actually searching for her name today, like in old re like workshop materials to see if I could come up with it. But I met this phenomenal librarian. All I can remember is that she was from New York City and she sat on the right hand side of the room, which doesn't help anybody right now. She's an elementary school librarian. And she really wanted the students to understand this idea that you can't just take that it's about properly giving credit, it's about respecting different rights. And so she had the classroom teacher does it have the kids make this like giant collage. So it was like this big huge poster board and every kid contributed to it and they all like drew and made all their stuff and then they made this great big collage. And then the librarian took the collage down to the library and hid it underneath a sheet. And so she gets all the students together and she gets them all excited and she says, oh, Cass, I'm so excited to show you my new piece of art. I worked so hard on it. It's so wonderful. And she pulls off the sheet. And of course, it's the collage that they had all made together. And she said the outrage was fantastic. Like they were so upset. You didn't make that. We made that. That's our collage. You can't take it. And given their outrage, she was then able to say, okay, great, let's talk about why we don't take other people's stuff. And so she created that initial experience so that they could know what it would feel like. And then hopefully they could start to translate that into that respect for something that's so intangible and is really hard to wrap your head around, whether you're, you know, seven or even, you know, 17. Like, this is not an easy, con uh, an easy concept for them to understand, but she made it super personal for them. And, and I thought that was just such a fantastic example. And I really wish I could remember her name. I would recognize her if I saw her on the street and be really glad to see her, but I can't remember her name. So you um, have the opposite problem that, that from me. I remember everyone's name, but not everybody's face. Does that make any sense? Like if yeah, I see, it does. Like, if I see the name in email, I'm like, oh yeah, that's, uh, that's Bill from North Dakota, and Yada, yada, yada. But if you walked up to me on the street, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't remember that. Uh, anyway, so uh, all that to say, don't take it personally if you walk up to me and I don't remember your name, but I remember your email address. Uh, I'll just be really glad to see you and recognize your face, but I might introduce you to someone so that you repeat your name again. Oh, that's a good trick. All right, so let's talk about fair use. You started, mm -hmm. you started to hint on, hint at. Right. Uh, and do you like my picture of the fair? Get it? I, I did. I got it. I liked the fair. Good, good. Uh, I, I worked hard on that one. Um, it was either this or a picture of some cattle at the county fair. But anyway. Hmm. Uh, so let's talk about fair use because there are a thousand misconceptions about fair use. And, uh, you know, we don't want to derail this into a, into a fight about fair use, but I think it's important to to know what what the guidelines are for fair use and I think uh, one of them one of them is that there really aren't a whole lot of guidelines for fair use I think that that's maybe the, the first place to start that uh, you know, you'll hear people say things like uh, well you can have you can use it if it's 10% of the content, you don't need to cite it and you can use it yourself. Or you can show seven minutes of a video in class or as long as it's for education, you can use it. Uh, 
uh, those are all all misconceptions that that, that are that are not true. Uh, you know, Beth and I have both read sections of the Copyright Act of 1976, which does get into fair use. And if you read it yourself, and I and I would recommend taking a look at it, it's the fair use section is somewhere around page 115 to 125. I can tell you that much. Uh, the the yes. guidelines for fair use is that ultimately it is up to a judge's discretion at the end of the day uh, on whether or not the your use um, is transformative if it takes away from someone's ability to earn income from from their work uh, if it is whether or not it is for editorial purposes whether or not it is for instructional purposes uh, whether or not there is a similar item available that would accomplish the same goal. Uh, so those are all some, some things to consider under the banner of, of fair use. Uh, you also need to consider the context of sharing, uh, like Beth has already mentioned, uh, and Tracy has mentioned it here as well. Uh, one of the examples that, that I give quite often, because it happens to me quite often, is that uh, you know, I've written 13,000 blog posts at this point in my life, which is a lot. Uh, and I am very grateful for the people who have followed me for years and like to sh and share my work on social media and, and all those other places. Uh, and from time to time, and probably a handful of times a year, I will come across a school website or a school blog that is copying and pasting or using my, my, my blog posts in their entirety on their own, which is actually a copyright violation. Uh, even though they are using it on their school site, and, this, and, all, and whenever I've addressed this, well, I just did it because I wanted to help my teachers find out more information about you, which is lovely, and I love that. Uh, but the better way to do it is to just, as Beth mentioned earlier, just to share a link to it uh, or share you know, the headline and a little comment on, you should read this if you're a, if you're a social studies teacher. You should read this if you're a math teacher. It might be useful for you, uh, as opposed to just copying and pasting it, it, it directly. Uh, you know, it's, it's kind of the same reason why you shouldn't photocopy the textbook. <laughs> if, if, you, if you made 100 copies of the textbook, and Pearson said to you, uh, well, we'd like our, our payment for that, please. Um, and you say, well, it's, it's fair use because it's for education. They say, no, 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 it doesn't, doesn't work quite that way. Uh, and another example of this, and Beth, I did not share this with you yesterday uh, when we were planning this uh, because I just thought about it this morning. I learned my first copyright lesson when I was an eighth grade student. I was in eighth grade band. Uh, so middle school band. I was a tuba player. I weighed 97 pounds, and I played the tuba uh, in the marching in the eighth grade marching band. Uh, and we went to a marching band festival. And my music teacher, uh, my band teacher, I won't give you his name because I looked him up the other day, and he has many books about teaching band out on the market right now. Uh, so I, I won't give you his name, but he went through and told all of the heads of the various uh, groups in the band, so I was in charge of the brass section, and I was responsible for keeping the original copies of the sheet music because you weren't supposed to have photocopies of the sheet music at the festival, but we all did. <laughs> we all had photocopies. So I was the keeper of the original copies so that if the, a judge came up and said, do you have the original copies, uh, we could say, yes, we did have them. Uh, so, yeah, that, that was actually my first introduction to copyright in hindsight uh, way back in, in 1990. <laughs> so, but, I, but you bring up a really great point, and I think this is where a lot of the misconceptions about fair use come from is it was – pretty unlikely unless you were in a big public situation like that that someone would notice if you had photocopied something too many times whereas now when you post something online it, as I always said to my teachers the second you post it online the gloves come off because now you don't have control over where that content can go and 
so I used to even talk to a lot of my students when we were doing projects and I would say, okay, at least at the middle school level, you don't really give them a choice at the elementary because they're trying to figure it out. But once we had gone through this, we would talk about it and say, okay, here's the project, here's what you're doing, it's your choice of how you choose to share. And so sometimes we would talk about wanting to have the opportunity to use something like our favorite music from iTunes. And so we would say, okay, we'll make these videos, we'll use our favorite music, we're not publishing it to the web, we're only gonna play it in class. You know, and then I think we came back under sort of that umbrella of saying, okay, it's a one-time use, it's in class, it's for education purposes. But we talked a lot about it and tried to help them understand how they could build that into their decision-making process. Um, and, and the other piece, too, is if something is copyrighted, though, is, and yeah, um, is sometimes you can just ask permission. And if someone grants you permission, you know, then it becomes a little bit different. You know, Richard, you mentioned Animoto. I was making an Animoto video like, years ago for someone, and I don't know why. I just desperately wanted to use the first, like, 30 seconds of the chapel song by this band called the Augustines. Or we... We are the Augustines. I can't even remember now. It was not a very well-known band. And so I actually contacted them. Like I emailed them and I Facebooked them and I tried everything I could to get in touch. And I'm like, I'm making this little Animoto. It's going to be shown to teachers. I just want to play the first 30 seconds. And they said yes. They were like, well, as long as all you want is like the instrumental from the beginning, you can have it. And so though, you know, then I was really excited. They told me how to cite it. I had a whole like credit section. I mean, that was as an adult, just to reach out, um, you know, but yeah. then it, it, it's at the discretion of the person, you know, we were talking yesterday, I had a student whose father is a, a professional photographer, and his son asked for permission to use a photo, and the father said no, which I loved, right. and it, his response was, do you want to eat? Like, no, you can't just take my pictures, <laughs> and, and that was a great lesson as well. Yeah, well, and I think that's uh, that brings up the other point is that uh, when it comes to asking permission, that uh, you know, I, I think well, yes, you, number one, you should ask permission, and, and and I think you shouldn't necessarily be upset if someone says no, you can't have a copy of my material mm -hmm. uh, or a material that I, I would say. Even more importantly, saying no, you can't have a copy of something that I purchased or I received from someone else. Uh, I'll give two examples of this in my own from my own life. Uh, I have a long-standing, uh, in-kind relationship, friendship with Lee and Sashi Lefevre, uh, the the people behind Common Craft, and I think many of you have seen the Common Craft videos. Uh, the Google Docs in plain English. Uh, they have. I love those. They have creative. They actually have a video, Creative Commons in mm -hmm. plain English. Uh, and and so for years, uh, Lee and Sashi have let me use their videos for free in my blog posts and in other places, uh, in presentations and whatnot. Um, but I don't have the permission to give you give. give you being editorial you, or it could be you, Beth, I don't have permission to give you the embed code so that you can use it in your blog post. Mm -hmm. um, and the same thing applies with slides. Uh, I had a, a conference that I, that I spoke at a couple of years ago, um, and they wanted a copy of my slides to distribute, and I said, you can have a copy of my slides, but there are some elements that I need to strip out before mm -hmm. I do that because uh, I don't have permission to to redistribute uh, the materials, the videos, and some of the images in this way. Uh, so I think that that's important to keep in mind. And likewise, I have a another uh, I have a lesson plan that I put in Google Docs years ago, and a colleague of mine was the person who actually wrote the lesson plan. And I said, "Can I write a blog post about this?" And he said, "Yes." And I shared it in, the, in a blog post. I haven't talked to him for years now. Uh, I, think I wrote the blog post in 2008. And people still ask me for a copy of that Google Doc, and I can't give that to them because I don't have the rights to it. I had permission to use it that for that 
purpose, but I don't have permission to, to give it away uh, any, any further than that. So, so I think you know it, it's important to, to have uh, to have that context. You know, think about how is it shared and, and where are you sharing this material. Uh, you know, is there an alternative that that you could use? I think that's an important thing to consider, particularly when we get back to image search or music search for kids. You know, a lot of times kids will come back to kids will come back to me and say, "Mr. Byrne, this is wicked hard. There's there aren't any pictures I can find." And I say, well. I bet there are. I bet there are pictures you can find. Well, mm -hmm. you, but all the good ones are taken. Yeah. <laughs> and that is, all the good ones are copyrighted. Uh, and so why can't we just use these? And I hear that, and I've heard that from teachers. I've, I've heard that from principals who say, you know, why, why does it matter? Uh, and to a principal and a teacher, I'd say, well, because you need to model uh, good digital, good digital, digital citizenship, and also because you don't want to get a. DMCA takedown notice from a, from a lawyer or you know uh, get hit with a bill from a lawyer uh, there are because there are some companies that uh, and some artists who who won't even uh, ask you to take their work down if you use it without permission they'll just send you a bill for it um, they'll just say well this is my this is a licensing fee and you've been using it for X number of days here's the bill for for the licensing fee um, so you do need to be be careful about that. Uh, well, I mean, yeah. I think, I think too, just on that similar alternative though. And hey, can I put a plug in for your blog? This is just like total shameless one. Um, sure. So the, okay. okay. So <laughs> on Richard's blog right now, uh, I wrote a post for him about this idea of creativity. And one of there's a group of like neuroscientists and educators at Johns Hopkins who've come up with essentially like a formula for teaching creativity and one of the things that they say like if we really want to be able to inspire that is how do we have students come up with alternative solutions and really push them thank you it's right there um, you know how do we push students to think about solutions in different ways and I know that I used to get things too like oh I need a picture of a girl with brown hair and I was like, why? And sometimes it was an opportunity for get, to get them, maybe they would rewrite something to adapt to what they found. Sometimes they were being super literal and we could talk about what does it mean to be illustrative or figurative. Um, and it just, I think it opens up more ways to get them to engage in more complex thinking. And so the limitations sometimes I think are really beneficial. Yeah, that's a good point. I, you know, I've never really thought about it in, in that way. Uh, that specificity of it. Uh, for, for folks who aren't uh, taking a look at the at the chat, there's a. I just put the link in the chat to the to the blog post that, that, that Beth mentioned and the res the uh, resources she mentioned. There's a links in there to the to the studies and to the book that that she used as well. Uh, so let's you know we're we got about 12 minutes left here and. Again, anyone who has any questions, feel free to, to pop them in there. As you can tell, Beth and I are more than happy to go off on any tangent. Uh, but my goodness, there's a lot of Creative Commons symbols out there, aren't there? Uh, yeah. <laughs> again, that, I think this is part of the reason why people don't use Creative Commons, uh, is that it, it, can, it gets confusing. Like, you know, What do all these little symbols mean? Uh, you know, Let's point out that the uh, the dollar symbol is pretty is a pretty obvious one. Non-commercial use. <laughs> Non-commercial. Uh, the SA share alike. Uh, the ND no derivatives, correct? Yes, no derivatives. Like, don't take it, mash it up, and do something else with it. Right. And that would, yeah. Yeah. So. And the the little person saying bye, you know, like to. To not, you know, to say where it came from, I think is always helpful and just again good good practice for kids. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great practice for kids. And actually, I have a little trick for that. I'll show it here on the screen. Uh, so I have a little trick that I use in Google Slides uh, for images. So since we're in Google Slides right now, let's do this. Uh, I'm putting a new slide and. I'm going to make this a blank one. Here, let me change the layout. So, 
as many of you know, in Google Slides, uh, you can go and do an insert image and you can do a search. Right? Uh, so you can do that. And let's say I want a picture of Mongolia. There's a mountain bike race in Mongolia that I want to do. Uh, so I want a picture of Mongolia. Well, you'll see the, the label says labeled for commercial reuse and modification. All right, great. Uh, let's just pick a picture, pick this one uh, here, Atlas of Mongolia. One of the things that I have kids do is before they insert this, just right click on that. Copy that link address. All right, image is in there, and now down in the speaker notes. All right, they at least have the source. Now, obviously, it's not a MLA or APA or pick your uh, pick your governing body uh, <laughs> properly formatted citation, but at least it's there. Uh, on a similar note, the explore function in Google Slides. So I'll take out this link. Uh, let's remove that. For some reason, I cannot highlight. There we go. All right. So let's search the web. We want to find a picture of Mongolia, or maybe a picture of a mountain bike. That's going to get me a whole lot of stuff. Go on a mountain bike in Mongolia, and I go to my images. All right. So let's take a look at that. Uh, that looks nothing like me. So you use this generic one here, right? So there it is. I love it. It's great. Labeled for commercial use with modification. And again, right click, copy a link address. Oop, I got a little click happy. Sorry. Beth, were you clicking at the same time that I was? No, I didn't touch anything. I'm watching you to see your technique. Oh. Well, uh, I got a little click I got a little click happy there. Uh, so I put that down there. Now, one other thing I'm going to have kids do, and this is where you may get some grumbles from your students, because uh, I know I certainly do whenever I've tried to do this with kids. Uh, I want to go and just verify, right, is that actually an image that I can use? Mm -hmm. Uh, because sometimes you'll find things that like, and if you spend any any amount of time reading popular tech blogs or you know, just popular blogs in general, uh, doesn't have to be a tech blog. If you subscribe to you know a half dozen of them, you'll find the same images over and over again in a lot of blog posts uh, because there's a you know, finite number of images that, that match and whatnot. Uh, and you'll start to recognize things. And so if you find something that's a little suspicious, like if you're like, um, you know what? I don't think that image actually is public domain or that image actually is Creative Commons license. One of the things you might do is, you know, go and take this image and upload it to Google Images itself and do a reverse image search or use uh, tineye.com and do a do a reverse image search to find the to see if you can find the original source. Um, so where's my uh, where's my link there? There's my link. We'll put it in tin eye, and it's going to do this reverse search to try to find. All right, there it is. So there's our original, um, but it also brings up some other stuff. That's it's similar to it. And, I think and, this, and in this case, I'm getting a little concerned because this is le leading me to Shutterstock images. That's very similar, but I guess they're not the same. Right? So, you know, like this one might might trigger me now if I see this right somewhere that doesn't have the Shutterstock logo on it. I might be a little suspicious, but. I'm getting a little nitpicky on that. So, I mean, sorry. I think 
No, well, just to, to kind of wrap this one up, and then we have a really good question that we should answer that's in, okay, the, that, that's in the chat. Go ahead. Um, so I think, you know, two pieces here, you know, one is, you know, like Richard said, re reverse searching. Sometimes I've actually found that someone's blog itself, they might say is Creative Commons licensed, and then they've used copyrighted materials. So, mm -hmm. the, like, the image itself is not free to use, but the person's blog is, and so that double-checking. Um, for older students, too, though, I loved Richard's trick of, like, using that Explorer tool to find media to then use in projects, because then it was, like, a multi-step process to teach how to do a bibliography, and sometimes kids just couldn't handle the whole thing at once. So it would say, okay, you're going to get all your images with the links just into a set of Google Slides, and then I would teach them, okay, here's how we're going to, you know, whether we, I think we were using Noodle Bib or something, so then we would go figure out how to make a proper bibliography, and we would put the proper bibliography information in the speaker notes, and we'd have this like multimedia bibliography that we could then use to go with everything. Um, but uh, before we go to this, Richard, the question yeah. from Courtney, and I, this is a great one, is in a closed learning management site where the public can't access your information, can you use copyrighted images since it's for educational purposes? And that, <laughs> so I, I can tell you from some of my experience because I've read terms of service, if you read the terms of service in the learning management system, most of them tell you not to use copyrighted information. So that's your first piece, is knowing that it may actually then be going against the terms of service of your learning management system. Um, you know, and then the other piece, too, is it, it comes back to, you know, the modeling and the, and the everything else. Um, I know it gets to be, you know, if you look at the terms of service in cloud storage, whether you're looking at OneDrive or Google Drive or any of those, it, it does actually say that you sh it has terms of service. Um, so technically not advisable. Um, I know people do it, but I mean, I do some instructional design for the university and they were very explicit about checking everything. Um, so there's nothing copyrighted. And also one thing to find out too is with your librarians, um, a lot of libraries are able to get certain limited use access to copyrighted material. So at least within our university, we, they call it the e-reserves. And then during, you know, the, the term, like the, you know, the school year term, like during the term, there's all this documentation available that you can't get otherwise. And at the end of the term, it disappears. And everything I download has this great big copyright notice on it uh, that says, like, I'm allowed to use it for my note-taking and don't share it and everything else. So sometimes librarians have, have cool systems that you may not know about, though. Yeah, and I think the last piece is, again, to consider the context of how it's being used. Like, Beth and I agree that this would be a, a whole nother webinar, a whole nother topic to talk about intellectual property and whatnot. Uh, but in, in short, if you think about getting back to the licensing of that content, if, if you purchase a license for it and it was for individual use, but then you put it into a university management system or some other uh, learning management system in which people had to pay to then access something that you had paid only a personal license for, uh, technically that's a violation of copyright. How would anyone ever find out? You know, it would be somebody who then shares it outside of that learning management system, and then you get into that, that whole can of worms. Um, but let's, uh, let's, try to, let's try to put a bow on this, if we can, uh, talk about briefly what's in the public domain. I use this picture specifically uh, because uh, most works uh, captured while as a, gov as a U.S. government employee uh, are in the public domain public domain, most, not all, but most, uh, you know, works that were created before 1923, most are in the public domain. Uh, what else is in the public domain that we're forgetting? Uh, it's, if it's timed out, if it was a government work. Yeah. 
Uh, it's, that's it's, about it. That's or about somebody, it. Like, or somebody says, I'm putting this in the public domain. Right. Uh, probably one of the most uh, prominent examples of this in the in the in the technology world is Robert Scoble. Uh, Robert Scoble is well known in the technology world uh, for, his, for his first. Bestseller, which, which was Naked Conversations, uh, and he's since written some other works and uh, very very popular tech blogger uh, has put all of, all of his pictures that are on Flickr are in the public domain. Uh, he did that probably uh, probably ten years ago. He released all of his works and all of his stuff in, uh, in the public domain, uh, in large part because he just wanted to make his pictures available to, to people. He wasn't looking to make money off of them. Uh, and you know that's uh, that's something that, that he does, and there are, and there are other photographers that, that do the same that, that put stuff in, their public, in the public domain. But let's talk about copyright friendly stuff. Where can we find it? Uh, how can you get it? Uh, in a nutshell, since I have since I have Google Slides open, let's take a look at what you can do with Google Slides. There's a new, relatively new Google Slides add-on called Unsplash Photos. And that will give you a huge gallery of photos that are free to use for commercial and personal purposes. And it's Although, really, yeah. I, I will make a plug though. I like going, I think if I was teaching Unsplash to students, I wouldn't let them get away with it this easy from the add ons, only because if I go to the Unsplash website, when I click the download button and I want to download it, it actually says to me, why don't you say thanks? And it gives me the information for how to properly give attribution. So like if I want a picture and I you know, click on download, it's going to say, why don't you credit this person? And I think that's a really nice, see, say thanks. Right and there. then it tells you what to copy. And, it, and I like the way it says, you know, it's not required, it's appreciated. And I think that's, again, if we come back to that idea of how do we teach copyright almost more from the standpoint of empathy versus just rule following, um, yeah. I would put that as a plug. Um, yeah. Uh, Pixabay, which I showed earlier, that's a good source for public domain images. Uh, you do want to make sure you turn on the safe search setting in Pixabay, uh, particularly in the school environment. Mm -hmm. uh, not that there's anything that's uh, too terrible, but in some context, it may not be great. Um, Jamendo for music. Uh, I'll also put in an art, uh, a plug for archive.org, uh, the Internet Archive. You'll find, uh, and that's one of those sites that, again, uh, I would search it and, for myself. But if I was going to have my kids use it, I probably wouldn't have them use it. What I would do is I would go on and find, let's say, 100 music tracks that were in the public domain uh, and download those and put them in a Google Drive folder or a Box.com folder or some kind of folder where they can go and get them. Just because what you can find on the Internet Archive isn't filtered. Uh, so, But I will put that plug in there. Uh, the Grateful Dead, by the way. Grateful Dead and Fish put most of their uh, recordings into the public domain um, with some stipulations. Um, for example, I want I wanted to use the Grateful Dead song "Built to Last" as the intro for what for a presentation that I'm doing later this year. And the music, while it's in the public domain, uh, the perf their performance recording is in the public domain. The music itself. Is it in the public domain? If that makes any sense, it's kind of a, a weird fine line there um, to actually license the music for my own commercial gain. Uh, it's quite expensive, <laughs> much more expensive than I'm getting paid for the presentation. I'll put it that way. <laughs> so I won't be using it. <laughs> uh, yeah, other places, you know, Wikimedia, Wikipedia, as we mentioned. Um, the Noun Project, Beth, you mentioned the Noun Project. Yeah, the Noun Project works, especially if you're looking for icons, and they'll give you the option for which version do you want to download. Um, so that can be, and that gives you a different way of thinking about things to use to use that. Um, and then, you know, Francis asked a question again, you know, along these lines, like, would you cite each image or list all the sources at the end? 
And I think it, we're going to go back to context. Um, I know when I do conference presentations, and I know that people might actually take a picture of a slide, I put the citation on every single side of where everything came from, because I always feel really bad when someone says I did something and I knew full well it wasn't me. Um, but you know, I've also seen you know presentations where you know at the very end they say like images listed in order of appearance kind of thing, and they cite them all there. So I, I think that's a a context. Um, but then, you know, like you've got up here is, you know, I think use your own images. Um, yeah. And whether it's having kids make them themselves or take them with their own, you know, phones, tablets, whatever, you know, I, I really, per I personally am always trying to get kids to make their own and not spend a zillion hours trying to find, you know, girl with brown hair. Yeah, and I say I always say make a classroom B-roll gallery. Uh, you know, have your kids look at their phones. They probably have a thousand pictures and a thousand video clips, and probably many of them are not pro not appropriate for the for a class project. But there probably are quite a few things on there that are appropriate, uh, and you know, have them all share them in a in a Google Drive folder, Box.com, Dropbox. You you. One note, one drive. You you pick your pick your service, uh, you know, and say, you know, I want you to pick ten pictures from your phone or ten video clips from your phone that everyone in the class is allowed to use. And you, know, you, you can talk about, you know, what does this mean when you say that other people can use your use your work? Uh, mm -hmm. that, that's a a great activity to do with to do with kids. And I'll put in a plug here for um, for a, a book. Uh, Called "Playing with Media," uh, written by Wes Fryer. He published it back in 2011, 2012, uh, somewhere around there. Uh, some of the references in it are a little bit dated. He spent some time talking about a, a blogging service that, that no longer exists. Uh, but uh, the framework for copyright and the framework for uh, helping kids understand what uh, what images and what media they can use, and what they can't use, it is very solid, and you can get it on uh, you know on Amazon or on his website for like it's like nine dollars, maybe not even that much uh, to to download it as a as an ebook. So uh, I'd recommend checking that out. Um, again, it's called Playing with Media. You can find it. Uh, the the author is uh, Wesley Fryer, who I'm, I'm sure many people know. So, so Beth, any last uh, any last thoughts comments? Concerns. No, I, I no, I think I think I think we've covered everything. I just think you know, again, I'm I'm thankful that so many people are here because I think this is just a really important conversation that we all need to have, and to not feel bad about having it over and over and over and over again. Um, there's a an educator in North Carolina, by the way, Matt, uh, by the name of Matt Scully, and he told me one time, like, you know, when the kids understand something, when they start to mock you with it, and I'm like, that's. Perfect. You know, like, <laughs> I, I would love, I, you know, when I think back about it, it's like, I know, I know, no copyrighted images. Great, you get it. That's awesome. So I would say keep going until they make fun of you, and that's that's when you know the lesson's been driven home. Cool. Great. Well, thanks, Beth, and thanks, everyone, who uh, who joined us and, and stayed with us through all of our rambling answers. This is a, this is a topic that, that I could keep talking about for probably three more hours tonight, but, uh, but, but it's dinner time, <laughs> but yeah, well, I would say domestic responsibilities beckon, uh, <laughs> but thanks everyone. If you, uh, if you'd like a copy of the recording of this and, or the, the slides here, uh, I'll be sending out a, a follow-up email to everyone who registered, uh, that contains both of those items. And of course, if you have any questions, Send me an email, Richard at burn media, or you can email Beth at brholland at gmail .com. So Perfect. thanks, everyone. All right, thanks for having me, Richard. My pleasure. Thanks, Beth. All right, have a great have a great night, everyone. Talk to you later.